Hey there, baseball fans. Another edition of the Prep Baseball Report of North Carolina uh, podcast. I'm Brandon Hall. He's Matt Payne. We're going to talk a little bit about high school baseball in North Carolina. Um, if you get a chance, remember, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button below. As we talk more, make sure that every time we, we uh, upload, you get a notification. Matt, how you doing, my man? Doing good. Another busy week, another ton of uh, a week of just a ton of information coming out on the website, and we're kind of settling into the pace of the spring and, and seeing games as long as and, and getting other things out. So uh, have you made that transition yet from that winter to spring? Or are we still kind of working on it? I think we're getting in that routine a little bit. Uh, you know, it's good to get out and see games. And then, like you said, we're trying to get rankings and some other things out and um, get caught up on that. But it's it's an exciting time of year. Let's jump right into it, and uh, obviously a, a ton of stuff going on throughout the week, but let's start with our player and pitcher of the week. Announced on Tuesday, of course on Wednesday, our diamond notes will come out, um, but you know, a week where there was a lot of competition for these awards, and let's start with Nate Hollenbach, right-handed pitcher from Rollsville High School, um, You know, did something pretty special, something that had never been done in school history, to earn our pitcher of the week. Yeah, perfect game. Uh... You know, that's extremely hard to do in high school, and uh, he struck out seven, so that tells me, uh, you know, they're playing good defense behind him, too. And uh, the most impressive thing is probably no walks for a high school game. Yeah, and he was a guy that he came to a scout day for us in the preseason, kind of a name that popped up, and obviously we've been tracking him for a little bit. But, you know, wiry frame, 6'3", 170, arm was pretty loose, worked pretty easy. Uh, looked like there was movement, some action on the baseball, so I'm assuming – you know, he, he was able to get some soft contacts and, and some some fairly easy outs for the defense. But that Franklinton club's got got some talent on it. That, that wasn't just a rollover game. That's a club that, you know, will have a chance to make some noise throughout the year. Uh, Peter Hans on that club, um, you know, and, and Holland backfired. I think, you know, complete game in 81 pitches. Like you said, he was f- throw, just flooding the zone with strikes, uh, you know, 72% strike rate. So, you know, congratulations to Nate. And I know one of your favorites in the 26 class took home our player of the week. Yeah, Jackson Matthews, uh, seven for seven on the week. And the big number for me is eight RBIs. Uh, he also had two doubles and a home run. But uh, I like guys that do it with guys on base. And, it, it, you know, seven for seven is impressive. But the drive in eight, that tells me he's up in some key spots. And uh, one game was against Marvin Ridge. And Marvin Ridge has a good club. So it wasn't like he was uh, playing slouch competition. Well, it was one of the things we've talked about with Huff. Obviously, with, with Baird, with Max White, with James Nesta, you know that that pitching staff has depth. We we figure they're going to be in most games. They've got a chance to mix and match. They've got a chance to to come at you with power arms. They got some pitch ability. Um, the question was going to be, especially as we get into a single elimination type deal at the end of the year, is how are they going to score runs consistently? And to this point, they really have, and they've been very consistent with how they they hit the ball. And I think. You know, Jackson's been in kind of a solidifying force in that lineup, um, and that's a lot to put on a freshman. We'll see if that carries over for the whole year. But, you know, the Clemson commit, you know, left-handed hitter, you know, excellent bat speed, showing excellent uh, barrel ability, you know, that ability to drive the baseball. But you'll also be a guy that Huff can lean on and say, okay, if we get in these RBI situations, we do have a guy in the lineup that's producing at a high rate. Um, and give them a chance to really make a run as they go later into the year. Yeah, I think he has some confidence to him. And, uh, you know, with those young guys, you always wonder when they when they have a week or two where they maybe struggle a little bit, how they bounce back from that late in the year when, um, you know, come conference tournament time and playoff time when it, it gets crunch time. Right. And that, that'll lead us right into, you know, the release of the Power 25. You know, so the Power 25 is uh, our staff's look at the entire state of North Carolina with every school that's playing for a state championship. Um, being eligible for the Power 25, um, and we would release it every other week. Uh, and, and Matt, talk a little bit about the the process you go through in terms of getting to know these teams, and then also trying to put them in some sort of order preseason first first edition of this Power 25, and then we'll actually jump into what we looked at with this Power 25 release. Yeah, I think when we do it, we try to look at the the most talented teams. Uh, prospect wise and depth wise and uh, you kind of start with with who has really good arms and who could win in a three game week and uh, 
you know, I know we, we started with Wake Forest at number one, like their depth. They're obviously off to a, a slow start. Uh, you know, to try to look at it sometimes is, you know, you take SEC football, uh, you, you know, those teams are typically favored when they play out of conference. And, you know, you look at these teams and who they're playing. If if we were in Vegas and there was odds on it, you know, who would be the favorite? And, uh, you know, it hasn't worked out that way for some teams. But uh, you got to think they'll figure it out at some point. And, um, you know, then if they don't, some of these teams, they'll obviously be out of there. But um, strength of schedule is a big thing, too. I mean, uh, I know we're not perfect with it, but, you know, we have history with some of these clubs and players and coaches. And you try to look at, you know, who's playing – competition and you know we've had some power 25 matchups early so if you lose to a power 25 it's you know it's hard to be punished as much as maybe you lose to to a team that's you know maybe not quite as good or as good of a record so far well and Pinecrest was one of those schools for me you know that they're off to a five and one start quality wins over Millbrook Terry Sanford and Wakefield to start the year their lone loss was to Myers Park who at the time was not in the power 25 and obviously with the start they are off to um, jumped into the Power 25 this week. Um, but that lone loss, you know, Myers Park, because their schedule was able to load up, and they, they threw three quality arms at Pinecrest, where as you get into late season situation, a spring break tournament, or even, you know, the state playoffs, one of those arms, two of those arms may not be available, you know, because they may have started a different game. You know, and so Pinecrest, even with those three arms, they weathered that storm, lost the game, but I think in, in – playing that game, learned a lot about themselves, learned a lot about, you know, what they're going to have to do to overcome situations like that. So that's a club for me that started at seven, stayed at seven, at five and one, but that loss is a lot of, of, of that pull mechanics that you're talking about and and how we have to kind of dive into what the record out actually means beyond what the record just says it is. Another one, Corinth Holders, you know, Corinth Holders, uh, and you can speak on this a little bit. I know they haven't just turned Briggs McKenzie loose. I still building pitch count. Um, I don't think Jet Music's throwing yet, but he's scheduled to throw soon. So teams like that, right? Yeah, I mean, Corinth, they had a, a key position player. I think he was a little banged up, missed some time. Uh, like you said, Jet hasn't threw yet, but he's expected to be back on the mound, I think, around spring break time. And, um, you know, they played J.H. Rose twice, and J.H. Rose made a big jump. and. Uh, quality wins there and, and you know they're they're on fire right now and uh, you know I think some coaches early in the year play to develop guys for later in the year uh, get some more guys involved early where I think some coaches you know play to do everything they can to win early and you know maybe don't look as much as developing late in the year and uh, not saying either is right or wrong but when we go through box scores you kind of see hey you know, they're holding this guy back or, you know, the lineup's changing a little bit. They're trying to keep some young guys involved in the program. So try to factor all that in as, as best we can. And, you know, but at the end of the day, everybody, you got to perform, you got to win. I mean, winning matters, but. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, yeah, you make, you, make, you make a good point. One of the schools that fell out of the rankings this week is the Burlington School. And obviously one of the reasons they're ranked is Tucker Holland. You know, the big lefty, he's got a chance to, especially later in the year, you know, really dominate an opponent. And until you get into a three-game series, you you know, if you get matched up with Tucker, they're the better team um, with most of the clubs in the state because of that arm. But when – and they do a good job of this. They've done it for years now at the Burlington School. You know, I think the school's been around for three years. But they're not – they weren't prepping Tucker to come out and fire 100 pitches right out of the sharp start. You know, so his first week was two to three innings. The next week's three to four innings. I think he threw four innings yesterday – um, in, in a game they won, but there's two things that happen there. One, Tucker has a chance maybe to peak later in the year because he's still building throughout the spring. He's not going to be fatigued. And then two, you're putting some guys in some situations where they're going to be pitching with leads, maybe pitching in tight games and beginning to develop them. Offensively, you're, you're giving your team a chance to start and say, hey, Tucker's got the ball, let's go, but Tucker's coming out. And now what? how do we react as a club? And then you know, for a team that's coming off a state championship, that that procedure worked. They had two big times arms last year with Tucker and then with the right handers at Maryland. But that development process, because honestly, power twenty five right now, I, I I don't I don't think if I were to ask a club that's outside the power twenty five, hey, you have a two choices. You can be in our power twenty five or you can play for a state championship. 
there's not a single coach <laughs> in the world going to go, I, I want the power 25. They're all going to pick the state championship. So it's that process of them getting there is interesting with how, how teams are going about it. Yeah, and you think, you know, hitting comes and goes throughout the year, no matter no matter how, how good you are, you know, you're, you're a pitching guy, you know you have to pitch to win. And some teams that maybe win on offense early, you kind of wonder if they can sustain that late when arms are going deeper into games or, you know, they're running into some every team's ace. So you like to see teams that, you know, can pitch it and are, are you know, holding other opponents to one or two runs. So one of the other teams I do want to talk about, we dropped Carey from 11 to 23. Obviously, that's a significant drop, but their record's at two two and four. You know, as you – I don't know that you've seen Carey. I think we have seen Carey as a staff, but I don't think you have. But as we're watching box scores, we're getting notes from people, we're, we're, we're getting notes from our staff that's out and about. Um, what, what, what are you seeing with the Imps? What led you to keep them in the power 25 with the two and four record? And what are your expectations for the Imps moving forward? Two losses were to Middle Creek, and, you know, Middle Creek along with East Forsyth is probably, you know, the hottest team in the state right now. Their offense has been on fire. Uh, we know what Kerry has. They have some some older bats. I think they'll, they're will they going to hit at some point, and uh, Gavin Turner on the mound, he's going to pitch it, and uh, the young guy we like, I think, better. Uh, yep. You know, expect him to come along throughout the year, and uh, they got Collins Black, so, you know, we I think they'll be okay, you know. It's there. And it, it's like everything else. One of the things that you know, we get to sit back and because we're covering the entire state, you know, there is culture within, within conferences. I know there was a big conference shakeup, but there are, there is a culture within conferences. You know, you probably went through it when you were playing and, and you can speak to how you guys were. But when I was going through, you know, when, right before I got to Millbrook, we were always in that one, two, three slot. But we were always in the top third with Sanderson and a couple other schools. Then there were schools in that, that league that we beat up on. You know, as, as Wake Forest came into the mix, as Rollsville was added to the mix, as Wakefield was added to the mix, those dynamics can shift. But it doesn't necessarily shift in one year because there's expectations on, on those staffs. There's expectations within the clubhouse. There's expectations in the dugout. We are supposed to. And that culture can, can kind of permeate and players make plays because that's what we do. And, and you, you see that a little bit. And I'm interested to see there's some clubs on this on this list, you know, Middle Creek. They, they've been a club kind of knocking on the door here. Charlotte Christian, year in and year out, is playing for a state title. Randleman's played for three consecutive state titles. Pinecrest played for a state title last year. T.C. Roberson, New Hanover, 8-9. J.H. Rose at 10. You know, these are clubs that perennially, probably since you and I were in high school, have, have kind of considered themselves contenders for state playoffs. When we look at, um, I'm just going through the list here, uh, you know, Reagan without Josh Hartle, you know, Carey, um, Orange, um, you know, who are these the clubs that maybe have a chance to, to grab it by the horns and change their culture a little bit and become one of those clubs that has a, has a chance to be a perennial, perennial playoff team with a chance to win a bunch of games in the, in the t- state tournament? Those are the clubs that will will look to stick in the Power Twenty Five in years to come. Having said all that, where who are some of the teams maybe at the bottom part of this ranking or just off of this ranking that you're kind of excited to watch over the next couple of weeks to see if they can make that run and make, push some of these clubs for spots in the Power Twenty Five? You mentioned Reagan. Uh, we know their their conference is really tough with East Forsyth and West Forsyth. Also. Uh, you know, Davies got a lineup that that can beat you on any night. And I believe Reagan's lost two games, both the East Forsyth. But when you play that competition early, you know, they may roll into conference tournament as a two or three seed, maybe lower, but they could easily win that conference. And then they get in the playoffs and, you know, you play may play a number one seed from a, a weaker conference. And, you know, it wouldn't be shocking to see a team like that make a run into the playoffs. Right. And uh, outside the outside the power 25, uh Look at Lee County. They're five and zero. Oh. They got Walker McDuffie, who, if Holland Beck hadn't threw a perfect game, he's probably pitcher of the week. Yeah, uh, he, and, and he's he, you know, he's my personal, he's my personal high school crush because that dude pitches the way I wish everybody pitched. He just just he, floods the zone, spins the ball in the zone, pitches with pace, doesn't get freaked out. I I I I love being around that guy when he's pitching. So. Um, that was, you know, when his name came across and we're trying to go through who's going to be pitcher of the week yesterday, 
that was a tough decision for me because Hollenbeck had, I think, perfect game trumps, especially in that scenario. It wasn't a, it wasn't a thirty-one to nothing perfect game. It was a three yeah. nothing game. Um, but you know, I, I, I'm such a big fan of Walker and how he goes about his business that I, I love seeing him have success. And then Lee County's, you know, has jumped on that back a little bit. You know, they've got other guys throwing well, and they've got an offense to produce some runs. I think that you're right. They're, they're knocking on the door to be in the Power 25. Yeah, and then uh, a sneaky team from uh, up my way is Hickory. I think they're off to a 5-0 and start. They got Lefevre's on the mound, who, you know, we saw over the winter and keeps getting better. And they have some older bats in that lineup that, you know, they've, they've been competitive the last couple of years and lost some close games. And it looks like this year they may have uh, – may have figured out how to win those games. They got a big win over over East Lincoln last night. That's an interesting region because you do have, you know, you and and it gets those clubs have to travel a little bit for some some of their games. Even their conference game, there's some travel. So I think going on the road in that part of the state is tougher than going on the road maybe in Raleigh or Charlotte, where you're jumping on the bus and you're going eight miles down the road. The thing I, I'm really interested to see with that is, you know, St. Stephen's has a guy. Hickory mm-hmm. has a guy. Watauga's swinging it. I mean, they're, they're scoring runs. Um, you know, that area, Asheville, and I know that all these clubs may be playing some different divisions, 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, whatever. But that area of the state, I think West Henderson's got an arm, has been a little bit underrepresented at times as we get deeper into state playoffs across the board. Some of it's they knock each other off just with the way the brackets play out. But I'm kind of interested this year. I think some of those clubs out from those areas will travel into Greensboro, will travel into Charlotte, and have a chance to knock off some perennial names. Um, because, like you're saying, it's not a one-year deal. This has been two to three years in coming. And you're around it constantly. You're seeing good baseball in that area of the state. Yeah, you talk about the league Hickory's in. They, You know, North Lincoln's in that conference, too. They, You know, they've made runs in the past. Uh they have some young talent this year. You know, East Lincoln always seems to be offensive. Uh, West Henderson, haven't seen them this year, but from the outside looking in, they, you know, they have Truett Manual. But it looks like they have a lineup with some guys who who think they're pretty good, some some right. tough guys, and interested to see what they do later in the year. And I, I think the other thing that's happened in that area is I think we, we've got a group of coaches, not, not that we haven't had it in the past, but I think that ability – to understand how social media works and to promote their clubs a little bit, to promote their kids a little bit has, you know, it adds to confidence. You know, when a coach is promoting, Hey, this, this is a freaking tough kid three for three. He left on left and he's bragging about a guy on social media. And it's, it's a fine line between blowing up a 16 year old and talking over your out over your skis as to what he can really do versus saying, here's what he is and here's what he's done. And here's why I love him. But we've seen numerous coaches, not just in the West, but across the state, really use those platforms as a way to communicate with their teams. And I've seen that, and West Henderson's a great example, because I think when, when, you, when you do see the social media stuff and then you see the way they're playing, the, the way that social media is being used to communicate with his players has allowed his players to play with confidence. And West Henderson comes to mind because he does, he does a tremendous job with that. And again, it's a harder place to get to sometimes for coaches. So I think he feels like, hey, I've got to get some information out to help my guys. But I, I see those guys playing better and better. And I, I wonder what the correlation is. We're not around them every day, so it's hard to tell. But I, it, I think it'd be a unique study with them. Yeah, I mean, these, you scroll through Twitter and there seems to be this, the same schools that pop up a lot. And, you know, like you said, they're not over overselling their guys, but hey, you know, they're giving box scores or, you know, top coaches. Drawn does a really good job with it. I see a lot yep. from uh, New Hanover and Ashley at the beach. And uh, I'm sure the players appreciate that. And it's it's very helpful to us as well. It helps us. And, I, I, you know, the other thing I've seen, I think that some of the draft arms are doing a pretty good job of just updating, you know, kind of the world here as to what I'm going to be throwing. I, I know uh, Burlington School's done a good job with Tucker Highland announcing his starts. I know Nathan Britton at Stuart Kramer has kind of put out his his plan. I've seen Bristol Carter, who's an offensive guy, lay out his team's plan and his BP days and on game days and what the plan is, when he's going to hit so the guys can get in there and see. Excuse me. So you're seeing people take advantage of the social media in a lot of different ways, um, which 
it's been here for a while, but I think it's one of those, it's a neat thing to see how it continues to walk, grow because it's not, it's, it's not people just pounding on their chest saying, look at me, look how good I am. It's people giving facts, um, but then backing stuff up with video and backing stuff up with, uh, with other ways that, you know, not only can they tell the world, but they're also communicating with their teams and their teammates in different ways too. So that's, for me, that's been fascinating to watch and try to keep it some time consuming to keep up with because, you know, a ton of great baseball in the state. Yeah, but, you, you know, you see the same names over and over. You start to check up on them. And, you know, we know college coaches are are scrolling and clicking and looking and, you know, making sure they're prepping for their, their summer schedule. Well, we're, we're, we're already starting to get phone calls. You know, have you seen this guy? Have you seen that guy? Um, you know, I'm going to pop in here. Do you, is there anything – you guys need from us and these guys. And typically college coaches won't give us too too in-depth a scouting report because they don't necessarily want a super secret guy to get out if they've if they've done their work. But you're seeing more and more coaches kind of have some of those ideas and, and they're seeing the same things we are. And it's, you know, our player of the week stuff, our power twenty five, because of that, the drop down boxes we have behind the paywall with the, you know, we're giving team information. We're giving some some insights as to what we're seeing, what we've seen when we've been on the road, what we think that's going on with this team. But then, you know, transition that to, to our article that drops on Wednesday is the diamond notes. You know, we've got 330 coaches across the state, I think, that we have contact information and we send information to. Typically, that diamond notes section, we're getting anywhere from 20 to 50 coaches kind of reply to that. And, and it's basically who played well. And then we just throw it into a sheet and bang. Um, you know, when, when players start showing up in that thing week after week after week, there's two things that happen. One, you and I start going, okay, I need to go see that guy. And the second thing that happened is you and I start getting phone calls of who is this guy? You know, is it a guy I need to go see? Is it a guy, and, you know, if we know him, we're, we try to be honest with those coaches in terms of what he can and can't do. We don't, we, we don't try to make determinations on where they go, um, but we try to give them factual information so they can make their decisions. Um, but if we don't know a guy, then we're going to try and get out and see him too. And so I think it's fascinating when we start getting that information back from coaches weekly, how that has an effect on you know recruiting and how it has an effect on player evaluation throughout the spring and what coaches are planning to do as they're on the road. I love diamond notes. Um, you know, you you see, I feel like every week when we do it, you see names that you you haven't heard of before, and I know the players have to appreciate their you know their coaches taking time and. You know, they'll send it in. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, the best guy on their team or, you know, the number nine hitter. If they have a good week, they're sending it in. And, right. um, you know, people can click on it and, and and learn about them and see what they're doing. Well, as we talk about players, one of the things that we'll be doing here over the next couple of weeks is starting to update our player rankings. You know, so that those rankings are updated through the season. At the end of the season, we'll have a massive update for the 23 class as we get closer and closer to the draft with them. Um, but this week, the class of 2023 rankings update from our winter events and from the, the early, early spring has dropped. Uh, Matt, I know you worked your tail off on, on those rankings and getting that stuff uh, posted. You know, Give me a little insight on the class you know, in terms of depth and, and what you like about this class um, as we're getting a chance to kind of finish our four years with them. I think, you know, Walker Jenkins is at the top. Uh, don't see that changing. Um, you know, he's super impressive. But when you scroll through it, there's a, there's a lot of arms in there that, you know, we've kind of had in that top 30 to 40 that, you know, we're hearing things on and guys are making jumps or guys are pitching better. And uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see the, the final list is, you know, the spring ends and, uh, we get closer to the draft. Yeah, and I, you know, I think obviously one solidified. I, I think it's it's it'll be an interesting conversation with where Walker falls in the draft. That, you know, he could go anywhere from the, the first overall pick, and and I don't see him falling much past the tenth. And you know, how much of that is is based on you know signing signing potential, and the teams that have the want to spend money, and the teams that just want to get a a, a value you know, pick, do they go the college route? Cause it's a, value, a little bit more of a value pick. So we'll, we'll watch that play out, but you know, that's a solid number one. I think you can make a case, you know, two through eight in terms of, especially with those arms, how you wanted to, how you wanted to put those guys in, the, in order. Um, and so for us, we'll be, we try not to go see these guys right out of the shoot. We want to see them after they've gotten rolling a little bit. So, 
you know, for me and you, it is going to be a lot of time on the road trying to check in on some of these guys. You've seen Mako. I think you've seen Meyer. Uh, I saw Luke Stevenson. I think you saw Macon Winslow. We've heard great things about Hayden LeFew. You know, so watching how these guys handle, you know, this year. And then also us kind of getting a check chance to check to see that off-season conditioning, that last year growth. What, is, what have their bodies really done? Um and putting our final grades on guys as we do get ready for the draft. Yeah. And, and, you know, look at some of the hitters in the, in the group. I know last year, you know, Garrett Michelle maybe wasn't as well known early, but by the time you get to May, you know, you show up at East Lincoln, there's pro guys rolling in to check on him. And, you know, I think there's a handful of bats in this class that um, have a chance to make a name for themselves throughout the spring and, and get some looks laid. And um, you scroll through and you see all the commitments, you know, in that class, you know, there's from, you know, 10 through 50, there's, you know, you can make an argument for a lot of guys and, you know, yes. when we have the same grade on them, uh, how they lined up. And, you know, I know early, you know, try not to try not to punish guys early, you know, trying to let it play out. And, and, you know, you hope you get it close to right at the end and, and give, give guys a chance to play throughout the year. And, you know, you said you try not to see them early and, you know, see them late when it's warmer and, you know, they're they're in better shape and make your judgment off that. And, and you make a great point. At 43, we have Wesley Jones, a right-handed pitcher out of Charlotte Christians, committed to Charlotte. And I went and watched him in his opening day start. You know, it's a home game for me. It's five minutes down the road. Um, they were honoring Greg Simmons, did a tremendous job honoring their former coach who passed away. Um, and Wesley took the bump and it was, you know, 88 to 91 until he wanted to go get a two. And then he wanted to go get a three on my gun on the gun next to me. It was a four. Um, you know, so we we're, we're saying, Hey, I saw a 93, you know, and then all of a sudden pro scouts are going, okay, we do I need to go see Wesley Jones? Brandon, when are you going to go see him again? Are you going to have updated notes on him? You know, they, they don't necessarily want to, they have the kind of idea of the guys they need to go see, but they know there's pop-up guys that are going to pop up. And, and Wesley Jones is one. And we got him at 43 and, you know, it'd be a name to watch. I know Davin Whitaker was a guy we have at 39. That was a big winner in our winter break. You know, a, a physical tooled out frame and the left-handed hitter. Um, you know, we both like some of the adjustments he made. We both like what he's done with his body in the off season in the last couple of years, you know, so now that's a name that's popping up there. So the States got depth. And, and I, I think you're, you're right in terms of, you know, being able to kind of track that, that depth throughout, you know, our list has been, um, you know, really eye opening, you know, just in terms of how good this class, you know, has a chance to be. And we may look up in three years and go, man, it was probably 70 players deep. Who knows? Because these guys are going to, a lot of these guys are going to go to college, obviously, and then they're going to continue to develop there. Yeah. It's, you know, even outside the, the top 100, there's kids committed to Division One schools. And, yeah. you know, you don't see that every year. And um, it's a, very talented class. Well, and one, yeah, I tell you one of the things that happened, I think this class got back to normal. I know we talked about it, talking about recruiting and recruiting essentials last week or the week before. Um, but the numbers are kind of back, you know, whereas we, some of those COVID years, we were seeing 300 to 350, uh, 350 players committed out of the state to go play college baseball. We're getting back to that 450 players in the state that are committed to play baseball. And you know, there, maybe there's some ebbs and flows in the state year after year, but there's not going to be tremendous jumps. That number is going to be in the general area just because of the number of schools that have baseball in our area, the population base in North Carolina, and the production of what our coaches have done, you know, from little league levels on up into high school developing these guys. You know, so we're seeing that, and, you know, you're still seeing how, how, are, how are programs adjusting to high school guys versus junior college guys versus portal guys. And so I think some of that is, you know, seeing those guys, you know, uh, can kind of continue to trickle down um, just based on where they have a chance to be as they continue to grow. Because programs may take a guy out of high school knowing he's got a little bit more of a developmental process ahead of him, but also knowing they can go get a portal guy for a year to give that player a year to kind of develop. Yeah, I think you scroll through it, you see some D2s have, you know, went back to the high school kid a little bit. You know, they – Definitely got some some good players out of this class, and maybe relying a little less on the on the portal. And uh, the JUCOs in this state are working too. You, you scroll through the list, and 
you know, you scroll down that commitment, you see a lot of a lot of JUCOs popping up in there, and those guys are out working. And uh, I, th- I think there'll be several more before it's said and done. Let's talk a, real quick about just a couple of the the uncommitted guys here that maybe stood out to you as you were going through the list. I know we published our 2023 all uncommitted team and, and profiled some of those guys, but are there any guys that as you were going through the list, you know, kind of popped out at you as man, that, that's going to be a good get for somebody. Uh, Josh Herbert at East Forsyth. And he's uh, putting up numbers. Him. He is in, he's in diamond notes every week. Um, he's in the box score all the time. He's off to a good start. Um, Samari so Robinson at green yep. level. You keep hearing his name a lot. We've seen him. It's got arm strength. I, I've heard he's made a jump on the mound. Uh, athletic kid. Um, guy you like, we've talked about, Travis Rhodes yep. uh, at, at Ledford. Um, Lucas Whitcomb at Hickory Ridge. Outings. Yeah. Whitcomb at Hickory Ridge. Connor Marin at New Hanover. Um, Blaze Leonard at Middle Creek. He's He's been in a lot of box scores for yep. a team that's, that's playing really well right now. And, um, you know, I'm sure these guys are getting recruited, but uh, – It'll be interesting to see where they where they end up at. One of the names that popped up for me was Samuel Bevan, who who enters at 103 in the rankings. You know, 2023 shortstop who just moved into the area. Um, he's playing with the Wake County Homeschool Warriors. I don't know the entire background um, in terms of bouncing around and ending up in North Carolina, but I know he he had been committed. I think part of the transition and the move opened his his recruitment back up, but you know, really athletic uh, middle infielder, potential pitcher, depending on what level he falls into. Looks like he can run, ran a good 30 for us, you know, showed explosion in his vertical jump at our winter events. There's some bat speed there. You know, I think there's going to be somebody, uh, and it may be pro scouts that help because you've got, I think, Cooper Clark, right, as a Wake County, Wake County homeschool warrior. Yep. So as, as pro guys go in and see Cooper, they may be able to help with Samuel, but there's going to be some colleges that maybe pop in on, on that club playing and, and get a surprise by seeing Samuel and maybe, you know, a little bit of a steal possibly getting out of there. Yep. And uh, another name, Ryan Hawkins. I think you got to see him early. Uh, he was at one of our winter events and uh, athletic kid. I think he gives whoever signs him, I think he gives a lot of versatility to defensively and, He's got some bat speed and hand strength and, uh, you know, excited for the year he has a chance to have. High, high level ball to bat ability. You know, it's it's not the prettiest swing. It's not the most rhythmic swing. You know, and he's a smaller guy, but there's hand strength and there's intent on every time he airs that bat out. You know, and he handled a couple good arms. And, I mean, was on the barrel, bang, bang, bang. Um you know, he's playing short at East Mech. I think that's interesting because you can get a chance to evaluate him on the infield. Um, I don't, you know, I, I could see him playing second in the right situation with a staff that has a chance to develop infielders. But I think with the way he runs, um, there, there's a good chance he ends up in the outfield. You know, whether that's center or left, you know, remains to be seen. But I think the bat has a chance to carry that. So, um, you know, a, another guy that, uh, I think somebody's going to be rewarded with because I think he has a chance to enter a program and and be a guy that produces in the fall and puts his name close to that lineup card as they enter the spring. For sure, and there's a there's an arm at West Carteret, C.W. Bayer. Saw yep. him last year. Can really spin a breaking ball. I think the velocity was around the mid 80s last year, but uh, haven't seen him this year. But I think he's a guy that you know will will have a role on a team somewhere and. When you can spin the ball like that, you can get out. So, you know, he was in the strike zone and, um, you know, hope he finds a home too. Yeah, and there's still a lot of recruitment to go on. I know we, we always talk about that number of, you know, after the November signing period, there's still 50% of the class still left to sign. In North Carolina, that's the way the numbers always work. So 50% is going to go in the early period, 50% is going to go after. Of that 50%, you know, you're still looking at 30% still look, looking for a place to play that are going to find a place before the high school season's done or before they before they enter college. So junior colleges, D2s, D3s, I, and I think, you know, D1s. There may be some D1s that have been a little bit hesitant to take their roster to that 40-man max that they're on this year 
thinking it was going to roll back to 35. And all of a sudden, there's five more spots because of the new rule. They're going to have 40 next year, 32 counters. Um, you know, I don't know that it's going to open up a ton of money for them, but it may open up possibilities of bringing some guys in as a walk-on, maybe for a year, then talking to them about the chance to earn earn a, uh, earn scholarship in the coming years. So that new rule change, and there's more rule changes coming. The NCAA is not done because it's going to be a complete revamp um, from what I'm hearing. But that one's got a chance maybe to affect the 23 class right now. You may see some some schools you know, making some reaches at, at players to try and fill those final uh, roster spots. Yeah, I think, you know, some coaches have been so heavy in the, in the portal, they're, you know, looking to get back to get some high school kids that have a chance to be program players and and help the culture and, and develop those guys. So I think it's it's good for these future classes coming out. I think you, you, you hit on something really important there. We talked about it with the high school and, and how year after year after year you can build culture, you can build expectations, even when you have a down year in talent. The expectations don't change, and players will play up to the culture. That can happen in college, too. It can go away if you're heavy on JUCO and heavy on portal because a lot of times those guys are really only trying to get there for for one year. They really, let's go, let's show out for one year, and let's get out. And it's not that they don't care about the team. It's not that they're not team players, but they don't get a chance to be immersed in the culture for two to three years and have have an effect on the culture. Um, and so I think having high school guys can be important in terms of, of long-term stability of a program year after year after year, you know, being a, a, a Florida state type program, even though they're going through coaching changes, you know, the expectation is they're going to be in a regional, even when, even when they're not very good, they, they just figure out there's going to, we're going to be in a regional, you know, and then you look at a, a program like Wichita state, which had won 40 games for 25 plus years but as soon as they kind of got away from that they missed 40 you know they they, they made a, a coaching change after winning 40 and being in a, in a regional it, it didn't stick they made another one it didn't stick they made another one you know those programs it can be it can be a dog fight to get the culture back just because it is so hard to win there are so many programs now invested in winning and invested in finding players and invested in developing players that winning 30 games is really, really tough. It is. And, you know, we've dealt with it. Juco kids and transfers, when they come in, they're, you know, have a selfishness to them, which, you know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but they're there for their numbers and their career and to get drafted a lot of times. So if, if the team struggles out of the gate, you may not have the foundation of the kid that's been in the program from freshman year. And, you know, the school is important too. the name on the jersey is important too, and, uh, you know, I think you got to have that when, you know, times get a little bit tougher versus if it's all transfers of new guys who maybe have never heard of the school before. And, you know, if they're not putting up numbers, then, you know, they maybe check out a little bit. Or if they are putting up numbers, maybe they, they don't care as much about winning as long as, you know, they're producing and, and they're, they're getting what they want. No doubt. And we, we, we both have seen it. And you both as a coach are fighting it. And the better coaches do a better job of fighting it. So, um <laughs> We'll, uh, I know we're, we're both probably on the road here coming up. I know we're both on the road later this week and trying to get out and see games and into the coming week and see as many games as possible. So, guys, there's going to be a ton of stuff on the website. The scouting blogs are going to continue to roll out based on games we've seen, player updates. I know Recruiting Essentials is scheduled to drop on Wednesday. Diamond Nose is scheduled to drop on Wednesday. This podcast will probably drop on Thursday. So go back into our news section. Scroll through there. There's game game updates, player updates, rankings updates, a ton of stuff going on. Um, and then hit us up. You know, fire away at this on YouTube or, or through Spotify. And, um, you know, hit us up on email. If you've got our, our cell phone numbers, text us. Let us know what's going on. Let us know where to be. Let us know what you think and, and how we're doing. Um, you know, Matt, any closing thoughts as we get ready to go? Anything? I know you got, you're got you done with the 23 rankings, so the next question is well, when the 24 is coming out. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're hard at work on those already. Uh, but any closing thoughts as we close this episode of the podcast? Uh, just excited to see how some things play out with certain players and certain teams throughout the year. You know, the our Power 25 has struggled early, so uh, it will be interesting to look back and see who's in there now versus uh, – who's in there at the end of the year. No doubt. Well, I'm Brandon Hall. He's Matt Payne. Smash that subscribe button. Come back and see us next week. 
uh, and we'll be out at the yard. So if you see us wandering around looking for popcorn, then come say hi, and we'll see you out there. Till next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.